We'll do look again, please, to Galatians uh, chapter 1, uh, verses 1 uh, to 5. And uh, keep your Bibles open, please, and uh, we'll also keep the text before you as we begin to work through uh, this very, very uh, important um, portion of Scripture. Now, as you will have heard before, the letter of Paul to the Galatians is a letter. So try to resist the temptation of calling it a book. It's not a book. There is no book of Galatians in your Bible. There is the letter of Paul to the Galatians. And you say, well, yeah, 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 uh, same thing. Um, no, not really. If you read it and understand it as a book, you're likely to misread it and perhaps misunderstand it. It's a letter. And as such, it's meant to be read and understood as a letter. And so if you can discipline yourself to remember that this is a letter, that will be very helpful indeed. Now, when you're looking at a letter, there are some things that you need to consider. You need to consider them, in fact, even before reading the letter. You need to consider questions such as, uh, who is this from? <clears throat> questions such as, who is this to? Questions such as, what is this about? Or what is the purpose for which this was written? Now, you, you do this when you receive a letter through the post, even today. I know some of you are quite young. Uh, there is something that in the old days, uh, called a letter, used to come through, you know, the, the mail slot, the, uh, the, the letter box, and I know you're much more apt to communicate, uh, you know, maybe by email, but I was reliably informed a couple of weeks ago that email is so old-fashioned, you know, it's, it's much better to communicate by text or WhatsApp or something like that, but I'm, you know, I'm still a dinosaur, so I, I remember... I remember letters, and when a letter comes through the post, you're interested to know these same sorts of things. You want to know uh, who is this from. So what you would do is you would look and see if maybe there's a return address, and the return address would tell you who this is from. You might even look to see if there's a familiar handwriting. Because if you recognize the handwriting, you have some idea about who it's from. Now that's especially relevant here in the letter of Paul to the Galatians because he's going to draw attention to the fact that he's actually written part of it with his own hand. And he uses this as an authenticating proof of its authority, uh, and its reliability, uh, but also as a means of making a very important spiritual point. And if you lack a return address or a familiar handwriting or a postmark or any of the other telltale signs of a letter's you know, writer, you may have found yourself holding an unopened letter up to your uh, head and almost thinking aloud, well, I wonder who this could be from. Because there's something about a letter that you don't feel that you should read it until you know who it's from. Because who a letter is from gives you some idea as to how you're going to respond. Is it from a friend or an enemy? Is it formal or informal? Is it something that's going to require a response? Or is it something that's just requiring no response or reply whatsoever? So you want to know uh, who it's from. You, you, you also want to know uh, who, who it's to. Now... Um, don't know what it was like in your house, 
But uh, in, in our house, if the children were not in school and the post came through the door, it was like a race to see who could get to the bottom of the stairs first to collect the post. And they would come back and they would be giving it to its intended recipient. And it was a special joy to them if they found a piece of mail addressed to them. Maybe a, a grandparent or maybe someone from church. They would even join things like, you remember the Protestant Truth Society used to have something called the Time Travelers Club. And they would even join things like that just so they could get a piece of post from time to time that had their own name on it. Uh, sometimes, though, you'll get posts that's misdirected. It's come to your address uh, by accident, by mistake. Maybe it's intended to go to someone else. Maybe it's intended to go to the person who lived at your address 13 years ago. And the thing is, if you get a piece of mail that's not directed specifically to you, well, that kind of affects the way you, you read it. If it makes promises, you find it sort of difficult to claim those promises because they were not intended for you. If it contains warnings and threats, well, you wouldn't take those warnings and threats very seriously because they weren't intended for you. But if, if you get something through the post and it has your name on it, well, that is something that you'll read with particularly wrapped attention. You, you also want to know uh, what, what it's about. Why is this person writing? Now, you, you have friends, I'm sure, I, I hope you do, that you will receive a letter from them occasionally. And I mean, it's a really nice long letter, penned very carefully. And you will sit down with a cup of tea and read that letter and then read it again and again and again. You can almost hear their voice in the reading of their letter. It's a friend. It's a family member. They're dear to you. And that affects the way you receive it. Occasionally, <laughs> you'll get a piece of mail from someone. The only time they ever write you is when they want to complain about something. or The only time they want to uh, write to you is, is, is when they want something, when they require something. You sort of dread reading, you know, their correspondence. What do they want this time? What am I going to need to do now? It's just sort of that way. So you want to know what it's about. Comes a certain time of the year, maybe it's a Christmas card. Maybe it's a, a birthday card. Comes a certain time of the month, maybe it's a, maybe it's a bill. Comes 14 days later, maybe it's a reminder that you didn't pay the bill the first time. Comes 30 days later, it's a, we're coming from you, or for you, if you don't, you know, get this settled as soon as possible. You want to know what it's about. And the thing is, if you can kind of get those things in your thinking, do you know, with the exception of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Acts of the Apostles, and basically about 75-80% of the Revelation, the rest of the New Testament is in the structural form of letters. And so if you can just kind of get that framework in your mind, you know, who is this from, who is this to, what is this about, it'll help you immensely in understanding a letter. Now, one thing you absolutely would not do if you received a letter is just sort of turn to the middle and read a paragraph or turn to the end and read one sentence or maybe start with the first sentence or two and lose interest and then maybe just sort of skim through the rest. You'd never understand 
what the writer of that letter intended. You would want to read the letter all the way through and you would want to really read it with your considered attention given the fact that it is from someone and to someone and about something that's really important. You got that? That'll help you as you think about the letters in the New Testament. Now, let's talk about those three things in regard to these five verses. Let's begin by talking about who this is from. Now, I know most of the time when we write letters today, if we write letters at all, we'll, uh, we'll write the letter and we'll come all the way to the very end. And then we'll give our name. In the ancient Near East, the practice was to actually give the name at the beginning. And so if you look at the letters in the New Testament, with very few exceptions, they always begin with the name of the writer. And so this letter is in the first instance from Paul. And as we work our way through the letter to the churches of Galatia, we'll learn quite a bit about Paul from this letter. But what I want to say about Paul at this point is that Paul was an apostle. And Paul, as an apostle, had visited this region of southern Galatia as a part of his first missionary journey. He had visited Lystra, Iconium, Derbe, and he had preached the gospel there as an apostle. Now, one of the things you might find interesting is that Paul doesn't always call himself an apostle. Now, if he wrote the church at Rome if he wrote the church at Corinth, if he wrote the church at Ephesus, or if he wrote the church at Colossae, for instance, he always refers to himself as an apostle. Now, if he wrote the church at Philippi, or if he wrote the individual personal letter to Philemon, in Philippians and in Philemon, he never refers to himself as an apostle. Not at all. Not even once. If you want to understand the meaning and message of Philippians and Philemon, that's an important indicator when someone always calls himself an apostle and then doesn't, there's a reason. Could it be that when he wrote to the church at Philippi, a church plagued by disunity because of the fractured relationship between Euodia and Syntyche, if in this context where each one was seeking their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ, The great need was not for someone to come in a position of authority, but in a posture of humility. Because even the Lord Jesus Christ, Philippians 2 would tell us, had these great titles which he willingly laid aside in order in humility to suffer on behalf of his people on the cross. Or when he wrote to Philemon, and he would say, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. Why, that sounds like an apostle, doesn't it? But then he continues and says, but for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you as a brother. Now, if he's writing the Corinthians, where there were these super apostles, so-called, who were, who were, you know, casting doubt and questioning the legitimacy of Paul's apostolic credentials, was very clear he's an apostle 
and he defends his apostleship. But, cat's out of the bag, you've already known by now that Alistair Begg is a favorite of mine. Uh, he really is. Uh, someone said, if you want Barry to preach better sermons, Alistair Begg's going to have to preach better sermons. Well, I, I wouldn't know that there's necessarily that straight a line of connection, but I, I really appreciate his ministry. And Alistair Begg contends that in Galatians, Paul goes to greater lengths to assert his apostleship than in any of his other letters. Listen to him. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Well, there's quite a lot there. And when we come to verse 6, we'll discover that there's even more. He's wanting to nail down the fact that he is an apostle. He has more than a business card, website, and jet plane. You know, he, he's a real apostle, a true apostle, and he wants them to know it. And that's important because he wants to persuade them of the fact that the gospel that he has preached to them is not man's gospel, but it is God's gospel. And he wants them to know that any other gospel other than this is false and needs to be rejected. And the proclaimer of it needs to be Accursed. Paul, an apostle. But you'll notice if you look on either side of the bracket there, on either side of the long hyphen rather, that Paul was not alone in writing this letter because it says, and all the brothers who are with me. Now, uh, sometimes, I'll, I'll just let you in on something. We, we may send you a letter or we may send you a card and at the end of it, it may say, Barry, Francis, and Abigail. And I hope this won't be too troubling. Sometimes Abigail will not even know the letter has been sent or the card has been posted and yet her name is there. You, you know what I'm talking about. Well, if that doesn't trouble you, do you know sometimes you will receive an email from Pastor Steve that says, Pastor Steve and Pastor Barry. Well, he's just making me feel good like we try to include Abigail and make her feel good. I didn't have anything to do with it. Most of the time I didn't even know he was sending it. That really puts your mind at ease, doesn't it? I just want you to know that when Paul says here, Paul an apostle and all the brothers who are with me, he's not referencing all the brothers who were with him in the same way that I'm referencing Abigail or myself. And that example I gave you somewhat tongue-in-cheek a moment ago, there were people who were actually vitally involved in the writing of this letter. This is especially the case given that Paul apparently had uh, some eye difficulty with which some of you can uh, sympathize and he needed someone to assist him in the writing of this and it's only when he needed to leave a mark that would show that it was actually from him uh, so uh, just so you'll know for our emails, if you ever see an Americanized spelling, you can say, well, I think Barry had something to do with that one. But um, that's who wrote this, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who were with me. Right? Job done. Now, that's half the story. That settles the question of human authorship. But that doesn't settle the question of divine authority. And the scriptures involve not only human authorship, they also, they also involve divine authority. I mean, when you look at the letter of Paul to the Galatians, I, I trust that you view this as more than simply the word of Paul. It is the word of God. It possesses the qualities of inerrancy and sufficiency that we spoke about last week from 2 Timothy chapter 3. 
Uh, this is the very Word of God. And so this is something that's very important for us to note, that God, I speak in the manner of men, wrote a letter to the churches of Galatia. That changes things. Uh, God does write. I, I, I hope you know God does write. Who inscribed his law on tablets of stone? God. Who wrote judgment on the palace wall in Daniel? God. Who knelt and wrote in the sand in John chapter 8? God. And so you have the law. That's Exodus. You have judgment. That's Daniel. You have mercy. That's gospel according to John. The three times that we are told explicitly that God wrote, we see the essential message of the Bible summed up in those three. Law, judgment, mercy. So when you see the letter of Paul to the Galatians, this has God's distinctive handwriting on it. And you're going to see the message of law, judgment, and mercy. Not just human authorship, but divine authority. So suddenly it changes things if we can say and believe that this letter is from God. Okay? Second item. Who is this letter to? Well, according to uh, the screen in front of us, the Bible in front of you, this letter is to the churches of Galatia. Now, that's important because normally when Paul wrote, he wrote to a church, singular, and not to churches, plural. But here he speaks of the churches of Galatia in the plural. Later, if you will read the entire letter, I, I would certainly encourage you to do so, uh, perhaps several times uh, over the weeks that we're studying this letter together, you'll see he'll make reference to the churches of Judea. Not a church, singular, but the churches plural. And so this is an especially important book for churches in gospel fellowship with one another. And quite often in this meeting we'll have folk uh, from Hyde Heath and from Lindslade and from uh, Edelsboro joining with us here to worship God and to sit together into the ministry of His Word. <laughs> what more appropriate letter could we study together? than one that shows us how gospel churches enjoy fellowship with one another. This is to the churches, plural, of Galatia. Now, oh, a lot of ink has been spilled over what part of Galatia. And I, I, I'm perfectly capable of boring you to tears, but I would prefer not to do that if possible. If you want to look into that further, I can point you in the right direction. I think it's pretty clearly southern Galatia, the region around Lystra, Iconium, and Derby, because Paul had actually been to the place. He had actually spoken to the people. He had some basis of relationship with them. That's very clear. And the Acts of the Apostles, though it's not exhaustive, it doesn't tell us every single thing uh, that Paul did. It is clearly representative of what he did. And the focal point of his ministry, first missionary journey, was Lystra, Iconium, Derby, southern Galatia. And so he's writing to these churches of Galatia. And what was happening? Well, after Paul left... After Paul left, 
the Judaizers came. And they had their extra biblical requirements for salvation. They had their extra biblical requirements for sanctification. And they troubled many people. And they turned many people aside from the simplicity of the gospel. And I, you, you, you can understand it. I, I, I can. I mean, if, if someone had told me when I first became a Christian that I had to memorize the four Gospels, if you know me very well, I would have memorized the four Gospels. If, if someone would have told me that I had to uh, learn... Uh, all of the hymns of Charles Wesley by heart. You know, I, I, would have, I would have learned all the hymns of Charles Wesley by heart. I mean, if when I had become a Christian, if someone had told me that I had to have a cross tattooed on my arm, well, let, let me show you. Now there's, if, if they would have told me that, I'd have had a cross tattooed on my Why? Because I wanted to be a Christian. I wanted to know and love and follow and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And if someone came and they said, oh, you know, what you've done is good, what you've experienced is good, but you also, I would have been very susceptible to the but you also's. And I think if we're honest, all of us would have been, perhaps even, some of us still are. That's what was happening here with the Judaizers. Now, that's all that we can say about who this is to. No, not really. You have to remember not only uh, this idea of the inspiration of Scripture, you have to remember also something called the canonization of Scripture. Now, the canonization of Scripture is the process through which different pieces of literature, books, letters, and the like were, were determined to be those who had not only human authorship but divine authority. They didn't decide what books would be in the Bible. They recognized those books that bore the hallmarks of biblical inspiration. And the process is canonization. What in the world does that have to do with anything? A lot. Because do you know, for instance, Paul wrote a number of letters that are not in the New Testament. Yeah. For instance, when he wrote the Corinthians, he said in 2 Corinthians, this is the third time that I'm writing to you. Wait a minute. Uh, for instance, uh, when he was writing one of those uh, circular letters, he said, now, uh, this letter is to you, Ephesians, but remember, I've also written a letter to the Laodiceans. Do you have a letter to the Laodiceans in your new... Well, actually, you do in Revelation 3, but it's one of those, you know, uh, short letters that came by John. You don't have a letter of Paul to the Laodiceans. Why? Because those letters were, they're actually called local. And that means that they were written for a specific local church, a specific local situation, specific local circumstances from which we are not to derive ongoing faith and practice. Galatians is in the Bible which means that the letter of Paul to the Galatians was not only to Lystra, Darby, and Iconium, but the letter of Paul to the Galatians is also to Lindslade, Dunstable, and Edelsborough. I, I hope you sense a developing seriousness about this matter because I began by saying that this letter is from God, and now I'm going so far as to say that this letter is from God to us. 
that's why it's important to look at this. Because it's not just a piece of ancient literature that, you know, maybe a very few people might be interested in. Now, this is something written by God to His people, even here, that all of us should be interested in. Okay, so that's, uh, that's two-thirds. How about the final third? It's not only who is this from and who is this to, but what is this about? Now, here's what we're going to do. We've got to remember Paul's method. Paul has a way, and we've seen it again and again, of giving us the definition and then the term. I'll save you the trouble. The term that he's defining does not appear in these verses. But the term that he is defining appears again and again and again and again and again and again. That is a very specific number of agains, by the way, in the passage that we will look at next Sunday afternoon, God willing. So I'll just see if I can lead you toward it. Grace to you. This term is something that is rooted in the grace of God. Any idea? Just hold it. It's something that's not only rooted in the grace of God, but it is something which results in peace with God. Some of you are beginning to nod your head. Do you think you know where Paul is going with this? It's rooted in grace. It results in peace. The root is grace. The fruit is peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This thing rooted in God's grace resulting in peace with God, is something that has been accomplished by our Lord Jesus Christ giving himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. And he has done all of this, whatever this is called, in full accordance with the will of our God and Father. And all of this is calculated in a predetermined way and fashion to result in eternal glory coming to him. Why did I say eternal? Because to whom be the glory forever and ever. And when you all know what he's talking about, you will say with Paul, amen. So, Pastor Steve, you nodded first. What's, what's What's the word here that he's defining? Gospel. So this letter is from God, it is to God's people, and it is about the gospel of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me summarize what I'm reliably informed took me 58 minutes to explain this morning at Wimbledon. I'm summarizing now. New churches are great. You just preach 58 minutes and they enjoy it. So, here we go. If this is all about the gospel, that gives rise to a very important question. What is the gospel all about? And the answer is given right here. Number one, listen quickly. The gospel is all about a person. The gospel is all about a person. Do you see it there? The Lord Jesus Christ. Christ tells us who he is. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one of God. Jesus tells us why he came. Because the angel said to Joseph, his earthly father, you will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. Lord tells us what he uh, accomplished because in raising him from the dead, he has been given a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we see here the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is, he's Christ, Why he's come, he's Jesus. What he has accomplished, 
He's been risen from the dead and he's called Lord. And the important use of the definite article. Oh, I wish you loved grammar. Because then that definite article would, would get you smiling from ear to ear. You see, there is not a Lord Jesus Christ, one among many. There is one and only Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the gospel is all about Him. It's all about a person. I don't know if any of you are on Twitter or not. A few years ago, Nine Marks Ministries uh, had a Twitter competition where they ask people to summarize the gospel. Now, of course, the idea behind Twitter is that you communicate your thoughts in 144 characters or less. Not 144 words, but 144 characters or less. They received thousands of submissions, and, you know, the higher-ups at Nine Marks Ministry, you know, went through them and announced a winner. Do you know the winners, because multiple people had given the same submission, left 141 characters on the table. They summarized the gospel in three characters. G-O-D. It gave rise to a book that some of you may have on your shelf, and if you don't, I would encourage you to get it and read it, called God is the gospel. The gospel is all about a person. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Second thing. I want you to see that the gospel is not only all about a person, but the gospel is all about a purchase. Draw near, friends, and listen. In just moments, we're going to take the bread and the cup Listen to the terms in which this purchase is described. Who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. The gospel is all about this great transaction. The gospel is all about this great exchange. The gospel is all about this great purchase that the Lord Jesus Christ has not had his life taken from him, but he has willingly and voluntarily given it. His blood was not spilt on Calvary's mountain. His blood was poured out intentionally and purposefully according to the preordained plan and purpose of God. He gave himself Why? For our sins. It's not just that he gave himself as an example. It's not just that he gave himself as an illustration of God's love. He gave himself for our sins. This is one of the primary texts which underlies our belief in what is called uh, penal substitution. We believe in the substitutionary atonement of our Lord Jesus Christ. He gave himself for our sins. He was the just dying in the place of the unjust that he might bring us to God. And he has done this, why? To deliver us from the present evil age. To deliver us. To deliver us. That is so important because Galatians is written to people who had been delivered but were in danger of being taken captive again. This is written to those for whom the Lord Jesus Christ had given Himself for their sins to deliver them from the present evil age. And He's done all of this, this grand uh, transaction, this grand exchange, this grand purchase has all been done in full accordance with the will of our God and Father. And the gospel is all about this person. The gospel is all about this purchase. 
And we have one final thing. The gospel is all about a purpose. And this is where there's a tremendous amount of misunderstanding even amongst professing Christians today. And that is what is the, what is the real purpose of the gospel. I hope you'll listen to me and hear a pastoral heart beating behind these words. The purpose of the gospel is decidedly not health, wealth, and prosperity. That's not the purpose of the gospel. I trust you will listen very keenly. The purpose of the gospel is not even just simply that you might have a fuller and more meaningful life. I trust you will not misunderstand. The purpose of the gospel is not even to give you an escape plan from hell. The purpose of the gospel is the glory of God. Let me explain. Glory, the underlying Greek word there, is the word from which we derive our English word doxology. Doxology is actually not a, a translation. Doxology is a transliteration where the underlying Greek word is brought into English. And so it is doxa here, and it is doxology as we uh, use it in English. And it is an ascription of worship, of praise, and honor, and glory to God. The, the term's original meaning had to do with weight. Now hear me out. If you were talking about something which is light, and frivolous. We all know about that. But sometimes you will turn your attention to something which is not light, which is not frivolous, and you will say, we are now discussing a weighty matter. You've used the term in that way, haven't you? It's not light, it's weighty. And weight is a term of measurement, and, and measurement matters. Does it matter how, um, how much a gold bar weighs? I can't wait to hear Pastor Steve's message from Nehemiah 7. I'm hoping he's going to tell us how much those gold bars uh, weighed and uh, how much they're uh, actually uh, worth. Uh, it, it, it makes a difference. Our uh, ladies, if you have a diamond, does it matter um, you know, how many carats it is? Weight is often equated to worth. And so if you speak of something being weighty, it's important. If you speak of some valuable uh, uh, substance having uh, weight uh, and measure, uh, it, it, it's because it's, it, it, it's valuable. And so what we do is we give glory, doxa, doxology to God for the gospel, that's the purpose of the gospel, that his weightiness and his worthiness might be fully displayed through the gospel. That his mercy, love, and grace toward undeserving sinners, these cardinal marks of his character and of his nature might be put on full display. That's what the gospel... Ultimately, the gospel is not about you and me. Ultimately, the gospel is about Him and how worthy He is and how weighty He is and how wonderful He is and how deserving of all glory and honor and praise He is. And so if you make the gospel about 
I stopped doing this and got closer to God. I started doing that and I was a better Christian. I took up this habit or that discipline or I left off that practice. Well, aren't you good? But if it's all a matter, I'm sinful. On my best day, I'm a suitable object for the wrath of God. But He in His great mercy, love, and grace toward undeserving sinners chose me ere time began. He sent His Son to live and die in my place. And He sent His Spirit to give me the gifts of of repentance and faith. I'm, I'm, I'm free. I've been delivered. What do you say? Praise me. You say, praise the Lord. Glory be to God. And if your understanding of the gospel points to how good you are, you have a faulty understanding of the gospel. But if your understanding of the gospel points people to how good and gracious and unbelievably merciful and kind and gracious God is to undeserving sinners, well, you might just be on to something. Now I'll close because the text is closed. And that's a good idea when the text closes, the preacher should uh, very, very soon thereafter. I do just want to show you the flip side of the coin because I think we miss this sometimes. Listen closely. God will receive the glory He deserves. Full stop. End of discussion. God will receive the glory He deserves. Through some... He will receive eternal glory for His mercy, love, and grace as undeserving sinners enjoy the eternal bliss of heaven. Heaven is His city. He is its only King. And to show you how How worthy He is? Why, the most worthwhile commodities on this earth are the material you build gates out of and the pavement you walk on with your feet. The King is more worthy than these. And He will receive glory as a great company which no man can number throughout all eternity will ascribe greatness to God for His mercy, love, and grace to undeserving sinners. That's that's good news. That's the gospel. But even in hell, did you hear me? Even in hell, God will receive glory. He will receive glory not for His mercy, love, and grace to undeserving sinners, but for His righteousness, His justice, and His holiness toward completely deserving sinners. God will receive the glory He deserves. You have heard the gospel. You've heard the gospel. You've heard of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have heard of His great work of redemption on the cross. You have heard of how if you turn from your sin and turn to Him, you will be saved. You have heard the gospel. Will you believe it? You have heard the gospel. Will you receive it? Nothing to do with me, you say? No, God has written this. And He's written it to His churches. And He's written it about the gospel. And you've heard it. Will you believe it? 
or not? Will you receive it or reject it? Will God receive glory through you for his mercy, love, and grace? Or will he receive glory through you for his righteousness, justice, and holiness? Our Father and our God, we can't but say with Mr. Hyam, great is the gospel of our glorious God. And we give thanks to you for this grand truth, for these great principles, and for these weak and feeble reminders that I have been able to give of a great and glorious God and of his wonderful gospel, which is a means of salvation to all who believe. Help us to do that for our Savior's sake.